good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to this session on neurosonography for the premature infant webinar is an online webinar uh, we from the trishur uh, iria city chapter is proud to host this program um, the program is uh, uh, is is twofold one is from the clinical perspective of a neonatologist and from the imaging uh, perspective of the radiologist the uh, the clinical perspectives will be highlighted by dr manoj vc uh, dr manoj vc uh, he is a neonatologist chief hod in uh, jubilee mission medical college and research center uh, he has is a very well known figure uh, in the field of neonatology in india as well as uh, worldwide he has also traveled uh, all over the world he has published various papers uh, in various national and international journals he is also the uh, neonatology forums in kerala and uh, india is uh, and also is a neonatology uh, chapter uh, I, iap executive member south zone uh, are is also a good friend and uh, he is also a proficient in zumba dancing and responsible for the uh, fitness initiative in trishur uh, dr roy george is is an old friend of mine uh, many of you might be remembering from trishur medical college uh, when we did our uh, dnb together yeah, he is currently the head of the department of radiology and imaging sciences at oas hospital alain uae he has done his uh, frcr uh, and uh, m med radiology from the uh, from the national Univers uh, university singapore uh, he is also averse in cardiac mri fetal echo and all those things and uh, uh, is uh, very is the right person who uh, was is working currently in the women and child uh, center of the uh, alain hospital welcome to you uh, dr roy and uh, dr manoj will be joining soon uh, before we start the session uh, i have I'm a, that. Sorry. ah dr manoj has joined thank you sorry for the late late entry <laughs> it's okay uh, thank you dr manoj we welcome you uh so without uh, much ado, uh, there is a short presentation uh, by mindray i would like to thank uh, uh company for uh, providing this forum so we have uh, given them uh, time for a short presentation over to you i'll stop here. thank you dr rajesh uh, good evening doctors uh, my name is ekam bram i am from the product marketing department within ultrasound division in mindray a uh, very warm welcome to all of you and I, we would also like to thank uh, ira trishur uh, for this partnership opportunity i am sure uh, many of you are aware uh, our recent uh, lecture we arranged with ira on a national basis uh, on the latest advances of shear wave elastography and we also launched uh, resono i9 premium ultrasound during that uh, uh, program on the last sunday 18th of july Uh, and both these shear wave lectures were been very highly appreciated, and uh, and and very similar to this, uh, we also support education programs across the imaging of all the specialities, and so we are very very happy to be part of today's uh, you know uh, cranial sonography, which is one of the interesting part of uh, Mindray ultrasound program, and uh, for almost two decades, Mindray is a rapidly growing uh, brand in healthcare area, and uh, Mindray ultrasound is no exception. thanks to the close relationship of mindray we are developing every day with all our customers and uh, this is purely based on innovation which again you know based on the deep insights that you know we have from users like you and also the pain point that you go through every day and we have been launching many innovative products uh, covering radiology ob gyne vascular msk cardiology and so forth and uh, fortunately based on our you know initiative of innovation and going to the, the customer insights and also the uh, ergonomics um, very highly appreciated from our design point for our product that we launched in 2021 we have received the most prestigious red dot design award as well as ifo design award uh, for the best design of uh, 
ultrasound system for 2021. And uh, Mindray's uh, new general uh, imaging premium ultrasound system, Resna i9, that we launched recently, brings a lot of innovation and agility uh, in the premium segment. And most importantly, Resna i9 brings a new generation of acquisition and processing technology called zone sonography technology, which is almost 10 times faster as compared to any other currently, you know, you uh, uh, prevailing ultrasound technology by any manufacturers. And about the system and also many of the important features, we will now share two product videos, one on the technology side, one on the clinical side, but it's a very short video. So we are very, very happy once again uh, to be part of this program. So um, we are on behalf of Mindray team. Let me thank uh, Trishur, IRA team, as well as all of you who have joined today for a great program ahead. Uh, we will sh now share the program. I mean, video, sorry. Uh, sir, we cannot hear the sound. Yeah, right. huh? Can you pause the video, please? We are not able to hear the sound. Okay. So, Nikhil or Manoj, somebody can do something about this? Yeah, Nikhil, you please share. Uh, yeah, just a minute. Uh, uh, Nikhil is trying to do something about this, sharing the video.
So this is the first part of the video and we have a short video for another couple of minutes on the clinical side of this. Uh, Nikhil, can you share it again? I'm going to show you the advanced features and performance of the Resina i9 system. I'll start by scanning the abdomen using the SC61 transducer. We can see the smooth and uniform liver and detailed renal image from near to far field. The i9 enhances the resolution and penetration, specifically for liver diagnosis of difficult patients, using sound speed compensation. This is a system that adapts sound speed to enable optimal tissue-specific imaging. Now, I'm going to show you the new glazing flow imaging. This is a brand new, innovative way to demonstrate the color and power Doppler flow in a 3D visualization. It provides an intuitive and easy visualization of renal flow, especially very tiny vessels. The i9 provides shear wave technology for scanning the liver. It has Sound Touch Elastography, STE, which enables the precise quantification of liver stiffness. This helps to grade the diagnosis and prognosis of liver fibrosis and cirrhosis with a good level of reproducibility. Thanks to the powerful processing capability of the ZST Plus platform, the new Sound Touch Elastography provides the highest frame rate of shear wave in the field, up to 10 times faster than the previous frame rate. This provides results with better stability and higher accuracy, giving you more confidence in your clinical diagnosis. The Resina i9 has quality indicators to improve the accuracy of measurements in shear wave images. The best possible frame for the STE image is indicated by five green stars in the Motion Stability Index and a completely green reliability RLB, map. This shows good shear wave quality and the presence of reliable indicators for better reproducibility of the stiffness measurement. Smart HRI is available on the Resina i9 system. It automatically calculates the brightness of the liver with the renal cortex in B mode. This smart hepatal renal index auto measurement is a fast, simple, reliable and cost-effective screening tool for identifying patients who do not have to undergo a liver biopsy for evaluation of steatosis. Now, I'm going to show you thyroid imaging with the L14-3, the new linear transducer in the i9 system. We can see a good uniformity of image throughout the thyroid parenchyma. I have now added the glazing flow, which demonstrates the blood flow using 3D visualization. It helps to intuitively understand the structure of blood flow and small vessels. Let's now move on to breast imaging with the L14-3 transducer. This breast preset maximizes the image quality, enhancing the contrast resolution to separate information about the lesion from the breast tissue. Activating the HD scope shows the lesion with higher resolution imaging in the ROI box. As you can see, the HD scope improves the image contrast in the specific area. This is especially useful for displaying the boundary and inner structure of the lesion. Smart Breast automatically calculates the mass contours and presents all the standard ultrasound features. It has demonstrated great potential in cancer diagnosis. As you can see, the i9 system provides standard protocol guidance on the touchscreen for high efficiency. It detects and measures the lesion automatically, then displays the result alongside the report. Smart breast or thyroid tools will make your routine clinical ultrasounds more accurate, productive, and easy to complete.
Doctor, that's a brief insight about our Resina I-9, which is a general imaging system and is creating really huge waves across the Europe. And uh, thank you for this opportunity and wish you once again. Program. Thank you, Mr. Thank Agassi. you, doctors. Thank uh, you, sir. Now, without much ado, we'll uh, start the program. I invite uh, Dr. Manoj VC. I had already introduced him. Um, uh, he is. He was. Uh, he, uh, also to say, he was my senior in uh, Trishul Medical College, and he was the chairman of our uh, uh, college union. <laughs> to add to that, and he is also involved in the uh, health activities of uh, <laughs> doctors in Trishul. Yeah, proponent of uh, Zumba dancing. Then, <laughs> apart from the so many academic things, he already is in the new field of neonatology. Over to you, Dr. Visi Manoj. Uh, he will give us an insight to uh, what the, we made this uh, uh, topic as uh, um, uh, seek and speak. What uh, what we should look for and uh, what language uh, we should be speaking. And that is very important that we speak in the wavelength, same wavelength as that of the uh, clinician. That is uh, very important. And over to you, Dr. Manoj. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rakesh, uh, Rajesh. Now, uh, uh, Rajesh, so kind of you to remember our college days and uh, uh, also uh, to, I mean, for the kind words of introduction. Uh, so without uh, wasting uh, any more time, uh, shall I start? Can I share my screen? Yeah, sure. Okay. At the outset, uh, uh, let me thank uh, again Dr. Rajesh and the uh, uh, team behind this uh, very unique event where uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach to uh, the new way to go to approach any problem as far as uh, uh, clinical medicine is concerned. Good evening, everybody. So uh, the, today we are uh, uh, going to discuss the various aspects of uh, neonatal brain ultrasound, the cranial ultrasound, or whatever you want to call it. So uh, let me just go back to our uh, good old days uh, when we were medical students and we were told that uh, there are uh, four ways, four pillars to bedside examination, inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation. But now, uh, re uh, increasingly there is a felt need to add the fifth pillar, the insonation. Why this has come? Because now the cranial ultrasound is come, uh, the ultrasound as it is, is coming from the sophisticated machines that we have in your office to the bedside. So this change is probably what is uh, uh, getting reflected in neonatology as well. So in modern day neonatology, we uh, the fifth pillar of examination is, uh, we call it otherwise the POCUS point of care ultrasound where we during our each day round if possible the idea would be to look at the brain look at the heart look at the lungs look at the gut line look at the lines uh, so these are the basic five things we always should look at but now focus is expanding more and more so we keep talking about looking at the kidney and uh, things like that but the idea is that the one-time examination or one-time imaging is not good enough in a neonate who is adapting from the fetal environment to the postnatal environment. So, the, the adapt, how is the adaptation going wrong? Had the adaptation been going uh, right, then those babies would not have been in neonatal ICU. They would have been with the mother and we don't do all these tests on them. So, the very fact that you are going to test on them which means that something may be wrong with the post the natural postnatal adaptation that the nature would have wanted and this is where the role of ultrasound comes in now i would focus my talk today exclusively on brain uh, we will not uh, pro probably these days people talk more about brain and heart have been the established uh, 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 the concepts in focus for now uh, more than two decades uh, uh, but now lungs, uh, gut and then the lines and uh, all other things are coming. But we will anyway restrict our talk ex ex uh, um, uh, only to the brain. So as far as brain is concerned, what is uh, POCUS or the, the see, uh, cranial ultrasound going to tell us? It's going to tell us as, as, as far as what do a clinician want? He, uh, he has some focus questions. Is this baby having intraventricular hemorrhage? So this 
focus questions are asked every day by the bedside is has he developed because it's not a one time affair once you diagnose and that is it it's not like adult medicine we all know that neonates are uh, in the bridge between both the worlds so the, there i mean it's a, a dynamic uh, evolution that you need to analyze secondly the so having picked up a lesion like an ivh you need to monitor that and how is he? is it going bad or is it improving so for both focus is the ideal way uh, uh, the uh, serial monitoring uh, of course heart if you uh, want to do the hemodynamics uh, is the one that you look at but in brain also the hemodynamics do need to be looked at so why do you need focus or cranial ultrasound by the bedside of course bedside technique means the baby need not be shifted every day to the ni uh, out of the nicu which is a cumbersome process and sometimes just not possible in a baby when on ventilated with inotropic support and etc etc it's readily as uh, accessible for defining any brain injury we have and we can, it's not a one time affair of course provided the person who does it has time we can do a real time follow up of the evolution whenever you want it suppose you find a clinical deterioration put the probe and see if what is going wrong and in the sickest as i said in the sickest and high risk preterm infants probably it may not be a good idea to move them to the uh, lab to do the detailed ultrasound and of course uh, the decision making also sometimes like uh, the, the typical example is in uh, intraventricular hemorrhage or in functional echocardiography we say the pda whether it is uh, whether you need to start uh, the uh, closure medical closure when can you stop and things like that so it's a functional decision for clinical management uh, so now in addition to this we have the second part that is a detailed ultrasound so before you go into that the why do you need a detailed ultra, uh, ultrasound well detailed ultrasound is definitely required it's just a bedside ultrasound alone might not be enough but that is the most practical thing in a sickest baby and when the baby is fit definitely we need to look at all the aspects we know now that cranial ultrasound is superior to mri in identifying some of the lesions calcification lenticulostriate vasculopathies germinolytic cysts uh, and all and especially in uh, the in, uh, in uh, diseases like uh, cmv infection now cmv infection is getting more and more rampant and these days we are seeing more and more manif newer manifestation probably because the prevalence of the uh, higher prevalence of cme infection in the mothers in the current era and the idea is you can't do MRI. MRI is a costly evaluation. You can't do MRI every day. CT scan is out of question. So then probably you are only left with ultrasound. And a detailed ultrasound cannot replace a bedside ultrasound or focus. But how uh, both have their own place. And secondly, uh, the machines that we use for bedside ultrasound, the Doppler examination, uh, uh should be these days now uh, uh, you, uh, you are the better judges you are the, this is the august forum of people who are actually doing it so probably you would know better uh the machine the, the previous era we did not have machines that did a accurate uh, ultrasound examination of the blood flow velocity by the bedside but now probably there you know the differentiation is being blurred the better machines are coming and they're being utilized in the bedside and now we know that detailed evaluation and a serial evaluation of brain growth in the preterm baby can help us in the uh, prediction of neurodermal outcome mri giving you a structural one time uh, view may not may be inferior to the repeated serial ultrasounds in a good hand when do you do this i know the next speaker is going to talk on when and how i would just draw your attention to the recent guidelines last year by the american academy of pediatrics uh, which uh, compared the various neuroimaging of preterm infants uh, cranial ultrasound should be done routinely in all neonates sick neonates and uh, one of the new changes is that now uh, not only and anterior frontally the mastoid frontally also has to be routinely evaluated in cranial ultrasound of course the posterior frontal lay the temporal windows and vascular images are optional depending on when you need or not 
initial scan now the timing actually there is lot of variation between the american protocol canadian protocol uk protocol the india we have a nnf protocol and all there lot of variation so the uh, 2020 amari aap guideline uh, says that the initial scan should be done within the first 7 days of life the repeat scan at 4 to 6 weeks and uh, then near, uh, at term because these are preterm babies you are talking about at term of 40 weeks you should be doing however Uh, in our nnf guidelines we add, we added one more parameter because in the first 3 days we get uh, the incidence of ivh and all is much more also probably uh, one more scan is added in the first 3 uh, days and second one between 7 to 10 days and third one for 28 days and fourth one at term so depending on the protocol you can do and the, probably the next speaker is going to tell us more about the recent guidelines on and how each one of is going to be useful for us cranial ultrasound is not the only imaging mri uh, aap does not really recommend it as a routine this thing even though bodies like the canadian and various other uh, bodies do recommend it to be routinely done at least once and uh, ideally mri should be a non sedated mri uh, but uh, this uh, whether to do it or not is based on which protocol you are following and all the protocols are very vehement about the radiation exposure in, in a growing brain and then ct should be avoided in uh, as and, and and it should be the last resort when nothing else works and the windows as i said now the mastoid frontal because now we we have started seeing more and more cerebellar hemorrhages also that's why probably this has come in the new guidelines now little bit about the clinical perspectives now when when i ask for a cranial ultrasound or when i do a cranial ultrasound depending on the clinician or who person who is doing it uh, what is it that you want to find out you are actually trying to look at the evolution of the various diseases the brain injury or the markers or consequences of various diseases on the brain so the brain injury the commonest is intraventricular hemorrhage especially in the preterm babies 15 to 20% of babies below 32 weeks have been Uh, reported to have ivh as a very large figure if you look at the numbers and then the hydrocephalus which may come along with that as or part of the anomalies and then of course the preterm inf- uh, uh, infants especially with the, um, uh, the problems in the mother like chorionitis and things like that you now have the periventricular leukomalacia coming in a big way and then of course in the all the not only in the preterm baby the meningitis and now we started using rust index and things like that for hypoxic ischemia and the birth asphyxia babies you can serially monitor and in condition like seizures anomalies everywhere so cranial ultrasound do have a role in any brain injury uh, you name it there is a role when you have non brain injury but babies have uh, get stuck on ventilator baby have comorbidities in such scenarios like in cardiac failure or a hemodynamically significant pda or in sepsis probably again cranial ultrasound has a role we'll just briefly uh, this is in seek and speak so i would just look at uh, what i am seeking and then let us discuss on that ivh we know the original classification by uh, papal is ct scan based where you have grade 1 2 3 and 4 for this august audience i am not going to uh, uh, elaborate on this classification but can we go beyond this classification beyond the papal classification for ivh yes we have now started doing and we have professor volpe's classification of uh, evolving classification of intraventricular hemorrhage that is your uh, that is based on purely based on ultrasound where you have three grades grade 1 2 3 and then you have a separate group uh, of uh, periventricular hemorrhagic infarction so now grade 1 we all know now so any baby can evolve through this that is a that is the beauty of this uh, arrangement like it depends on what day of life we are doing the cranial ultrasound the other way is you are just going to do one set and ct scan you are going to do more than one you don't do ct scan now i said so if you are going to do you are going to do only once so you are really not going to do justice whereas in ultrasound you can do keep going on every day you can see if you have time at least the days when we, uh, as per the recommendations as per the unit protocol when you look at you can see whether what is the evolution of the uh, bleed initially 
we know because of the typical anatomical features in the germinal matrix is the area that and the, especially in the cordothalamic notch is the area where it starts bleeding so that is very fine and that is a grade one and once the blood spreads on to the lateral ventricles till the time it is uh, uh, up to 50 percent we call it grade two when it fills more than 50 percent of the ventricle we start calling it grade three so it's a very easy classification but with a lot of prognostic significance and when it's beyond that when the hemorrhage has spread into outside the ventricle and uh, what is going to happen is there are a lot of uh, venous uh, connections and these veins are going to get infarcted and this is the well, the tragic periventricular hemorrhagic infarction a short shot for brain injury in the subsequent days so why, why do you need this classification this will tell us much better previously we had only this so where you tell us zero percent grade one is uh, dangerous only five percent dangerous 20 to 55 percent 80 percent but this is a very static rigid way of classifying a brain uh, lesion and if i am the parent i would like to know more than this so grade one and two previously which we thought will all resolve and then they're okay we now know that they may not become okay there are enough studies now which tell us that they may initially appear to be okay but there may be possible adverse effects depending on the studies i can name it the severity is uh, even up to frightening levels but the outcome through the school age of classic performance everything has been reported to be less than optimal in these grades where of course but the major problem of course definitely comes in grade 3 and beyond so in grade 3 the mortality itself has been reported as something like 10 to 20 percent and cognitive and motor deficit is very very high 30 to 40 percent uh, and when you have more than grade 3 when you have periventricular hemorrhagic uh, infarction in these cases yes the mortality is pretty high 50 to 80 percent mortality and neurology impairment is also pretty high but having said that now the beauty of cranial ultrasound focus is that we know beyond this now we know that it is just because you brand it as pvhi peri and, and appendicular hemorrhagic infarction doesn't mean it's so bad depending on the site of the lesion if it is in the parietal lobe it is pretty bad because that is the area where you know that all the important things uh, connections all take place so these babies are sure i mean are likely to develop contralateral cerebral palsy whereas in the frontal and temporal lobes outcomes have been varying and it's not as bad so real-time prognostication and the gradation so it tells us much more data regarding the interventricular hemorrhage and this is the beauty of ultrasound and then it's so after doing an ultrasound when you counsel the parents because you need to correlate with the clinical profile and this is where this really helps now as i said the new concept uh, uh that is gaining uh, the importance is the bad out adverse outcomes with cerebellar hemorrhage and cerebellar out, uh, hemorrhage has been like uh, noticed especially in the even in the uh, term babies in asphyxia and things like that so it is now recommended that all cranial ultrasound uh, views should also report a mastoid view uh, basically the idea is to look at the cerebellar lesions and of course the other things but then of course if you have uh, enough time and things like that you should uh, look at the other windows also not only the anterior frontal and mastoid the posterior uh, frontal lay temporal window and various other areas also you can probably look at now one of the direct complications of uh, interventricular hemorrhage is the hydrocephalus and then hydrocephalus when it happens post hemorrhagic there is always a confusion of what to do now uh, cranial ultrasound comes very very handy uh, so you look at three indices the livings i would don't need to tell you what is that because you are the people who know that does it every day you need to look at so as far as the neontologist is concerned he needs to know what is the living index value what is the thalamo occipital distance what is the anterior horn width and having got all these values what am i going to do i am going to prognosticate i will uh, uh, see okay now when the ventricular index or any of these values is four millimeters above the 97th centile so 97th centile is based on the charts available we have no charts for various population and various the things so you, you and then the action line is four millimeter above so you have a 97th centile values and then when it's four millimeters above that that is the time you call the neurosurgeon request him for a shunt or a some sort of intervention because this is the recommended time 
when you do intervene so here the values to remember are uh, probably uh, i don't need to tell you these values all these values are known to you so i'll skip this another problem since we started now seeing smaller and smaller babies is the periventricular leukomalacia and this is a lesion that is a very interesting lesion some of the babies see th these babies whom we subsequently detect to have uh, spastic diplegia and all these babies actually you know when you if you trace the history they don't have much of nicu history they just did a preterm baby born at 28 weeks received some cpap uh, and then baby was well uh, baby started tolerating feed shifted to mother discharge and all that and then routine ultrasound or rather during the uh, hospital stage so you do and then you find periventricular leukomalacia so which means that uh, this is a lesion that is defying the logic and why, when we started looking more into it we now know that the antenatal factors like the chorionitis all have some role to play in this the grades of pvl i am not going to tell you again this is not uh, you are the people who should be t talking extensively and then we are going to have a session on this grade two uh, one two three uh, and then of course the uh, grade four but um, uh, let me just look at what the neonatologists want so i need to first know that what is the grade of pvl that you are looking at so this is again um, for those who are actually interpreting actually probably this mistake still keeps happening uh, the grade one pvl you report only after seven days before seven days all the periventricular echo density that you see in a preterm can be reported as normal after seven days only you term it as grade one and then as it evolves into small localizes you call it grade two and then you uh, extensively grade three four uh, unfortunately cranial ultrasound is not good for non-cystic pvl demarcation where uh, probably uh, mri scores but then cystic pvl is a common one and that is what we'll discuss so to predict the outcome uh, we now know that later uh, ultrasound is more useful serial ultrasound is always better so we'll know that how fast is that progression from the previous value and then uh, if you look at the uh, figures the, by the largest cohort of extreme preterm babies in that from the 2019 published in neonatology by Barton and et al then you find that 83 percent of uh, grade 2 pvl and 91 percent of grade 3 pvl have risk for cerebral palsy uh, so this is for, as far as cystic pvl is concerned the diffuse non-cystic white matter injury is a uh, area of grave concern these days but then the, you can know it is there but the grading and reliable prognostication is probably not uh, within the scope of the ultrasound we also now have various other we need to know that so basically when you have a ba baby a high risk infant preterm or a high risk term baby uh, the question parents are going to ask is how is the go brain going to be is the baby going to do well is the baby going to achieve the milestones on time is the baby going to uh, do well in school so prediction of neurodevelopmental outcome uh, now we have recently incorporated various new parameters like a corpus callosum length circumference area uh, previously even there is a time when you say oh, absent corpus callosum oh there is nothing but we know now that all has their own significance in there uh, perspective biparietal diameter ventricular ratio ventricular size subarachnoid space enlargement all these may help us in predicting the neurodevelopmental outcome so uh, ultrasound is a whole package it is going to give us a wealth of information and inspection palpation uh, percussion and insonation has to be the way when you examine a unit the last little bit about the cerebral uh, doppler and the resistive index uh, I'll just touch only on this because this is again, a, 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 the clinical implications are too many. So, uh, why am I interested in uh, the resistive index? Because babies who are depressed at birth, asphyxia. So, if I can calculate the resistive index and then you have a golden value called 0 0.75 and then plus or minus 1, if you're going to take that as value. So, when you have a lower resistive index and a progressively lower values, then you are probably looking at worser outcome. And in various other conditions like hydrocephalus, 
PDA, sepsis, etc. When you the RI may be high or absent, uh, or even there may be reversal. So all these are going to tell me some information about the progress of the baby. So I think we will stop here and discuss further since I have overshot the time. Uh, let me again thank Rajesh uh, for this great opportunity to interact with you. I am ready to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. That was uh, exactly what the uh, what we had uh, asked for. Uh, your uh, presentation was excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we will take the questions later and invite Dr. Roy and uh, uh, have the discussion after uh, we have a panel discussion after if that is okay with you. Manoj, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, perfectly okay. I'm interested to hear what uh, Dr. Yeah. Roy want to. Uh, it's a learning process yeah. always. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Roy George, uh, uh, you, you may have not met him. He is currently working in uh, UAE Allen Hospital. I had already introduced him in the, uh, before the talk. Um, yeah, he, he has worked for a short stint in Trishur uh, uh, Medical College uh, when Dr. Ratnagumari was there. Chief here. We can be from here along with me. Uh, over to you, Dr. Roy. He will give us the uh, how. Um, now, Dr. Manoj has uh, uh, said what is expected from our part, and uh, Dr. Roy will, uh, will focus on how it is done and wh uh, what is to be done, what points we should be looking for. Over to you, Dr. Roy. Dr. Roy, you are muted. You are muted still. Muted. Yeah. No, no, you're still muted now. You're you're again muted yourself. Okay. Okay. Are you able to uh, yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. First, let me start uh, sharing Same. my screen. I'm not able to, no, I'm not able to share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? No, no, no. Nobody is sharing the screen now. You should be able to. Can you see the share share screen button? Are you able to see the sharing button? Yeah, yeah, but when I'm, yeah, okay. Now I think uh, it's coming. Yeah. Are you able to see? Yeah, yeah. You can make it full screen now. Yeah, yeah. So I, I hope everybody can see the screen. You are able to see the screen? Yes, very much. Okay. You can carry on. Start. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, uh, for uh, the introduction and also for the invitation to give me a chance to talk to you. And today I will be talking on uh, uh, screening ultrasound for preterm neonatal babies. 
my talk will be limited only to the screening ultrasound of the preterm babies because cranial ultrasound is a big topic that we can talk for one day we, it includes a lot of elements but i will be limiting my talk only to the screening ultrasound for the preterm babies only preterm baby screening ultrasound is necessary to identify intraventricular hemorrhage that's the purpose of screening ultrasound of preterm babies we have a role of ultrasound in neonates not only for uh, intracranial hemorrhage but for different purposes so i will not be including any of that parameters in my talk so i will be basically trying to convey to you few points that why there should be a screening ultrasound for the preterm babies and when you should do a pre uh, uh, screening ultrasound and how to follow up these babies and how to grade the hemorrhage how to look for uh, periventricular uh, uh, pbl this will be the subject of my talk so as an overview why ultrasound is used ultrasound is the most widely used neural imaging procedure because it's very easy and it it can be repeated and it assess the neurologic status of the child where clinical and examination and symptoms are often non specific the aims of this ultrasound is to i am not uh, going to uh, dictate all the uh, details of what i have written here but i we will be our talk will be limited to screening ultrasound that when we are talking about the advantages we can start to advantage we should remember very clearly we can start early early imaging and serial imaging this is the importance of ultrasound screening unlike ct or mr regarding indications as i mentioned there are a lot of indications for a cranial ultrasound but the indication for a screening ultrasound whether the baby is premature what is the age uh, of the baby what is the weight of the baby these are the criteria to assess the indications precautions we know all the precautions what we should take for ultrasound imaging but remember we are dealing with very premature babies they are in the incubators so we should do the ultrasound without disturbing the baby and we should do only in the incubator as much as possible don't try to take out the baby and try to maintain the temperature avoid unnecessary pressure on the anterior fundrenula make all aseptic precautions as necessary the technique of the ultrasound basically the most recommended probe for a ultrasound is small footprint sector probe but in my experience you can use any probe what is available in your institution but if you are purchasing a probe dedicated for the neonatal brain imaging it should be for a small uh, footprint uh, sector probe when we started our ultrasound we were using a transvaginal probe then we shifted to um, uh, 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 a yeah, convex probe all these probes can give you results but the optimum results will be given by a small footprint sector if your institution is capable of purchasing a dedicated machine and dedicated probe this should be the probe but all probe has its own advantages then linear probe high frequency linear probe also can be tried if it is available and you don't have a small uh, foot, uh, uh, footprint sector probe and curvilinear probes see whatever probes you are using it should be able to have 5 to 10 megapixel uh, uh, hertz uh, capability and all this have its own advantages transvaginal probe if you are have this will give a good images the only problem is managing the ultrasound in the incubator with a transvaginal probe will be difficult so these are about some of the probes uh, uh, otherwise whatever probe you have go on trying it try to see the images you should be able to see the side to side brain uh, aspect and you should be able to see and it to posteriorly this is the only concept and you, the importance is you, are, you remember you are doing the scan within the incubator 
this will make you restricted in your mobility so transvaginal probes and all should not be used in a regular basis but if you do not have a probe uh, dedicated for the brain you can use any probe which is available with your experience so when you are doing a scan we all are doing cranial ultrasound from our uh, uh, post graduation time but i don't think we had a dedicated structural uh, or uh, programmed way of uh, performing an ultrasound so when we are doing an ultrasound for neonatal brain we should have some protocols so the standard protocol for brain ultrasound will have six coronal views and five sagittal views the six coronal views are called c1 c2 c3 c4 and c5 and c6 these are the standard coronal views for performing a neonatal ultrasound so the c1 is the anterior most scan you will be keeping the probe in the anterior fontanelle and you will not will be moving it slightly anterior and the section will pass through only the frontal lobe without including the uh, lateral uh, ventricle so this is the first uh, section that you should be taking that also called c1 that will pass through the frontal lobes c2 will pass through the most frontal horn of the lateral ventricle you will be seeing frontal horns of the lateral ventricle and the rest of the brain that is c2 c3 you will be crossing again will be move, moving 15 degrees 15 degrees posteriorly then you will be able to see the uh, the section through the uh, foramen of munro that is c3 c4 will be in the mid uh, uh, lateral ventricle uh, through the body of the lateral ventricle that will be c4 c5 will be through the trigone of the lateral ventricle where you will see the bulk of the choroid plexus c6 will be through the occipital uh, lobes parieto occipital lobes and you will not see any lateral ventricle so c1 and c6 will not have any lateral ventricle all other views c2 to c5 will have a lateral ventricle and i have already mentioned and which level you should be taking so these are the standard coronal views that you should be doing for all the babies the importance of this protocol when somebody analyzes even if a technician does the scan in our institution most of the scans are done by the technicians or we are only interpreting like uh, the european countries or other uh, australia but uh, i we know i know that in india we are doing ourselves but the structured protocol the image is important for uh, repeat when you are repeating the scan you can repeat the scan in the same level and you can reassess you if you are doing in a slightly different angle you will not be able to compare the previous image with the current image coming to the sagittal images sagittal images are five the central image is uh, s3 the most right one will be s1 the second will be s2 the third will be the mid sagittal then 4 5 1 2 3 4 5 s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 so we will be starting the scan from right to left or you can start from the mid line to the right then to the left so the first scan will be s3 that will be the mid sagittal plane you will be able to see the corpus callosum and the, that is a mid sagittal image then two parasagittal images that will be 2 and 4 s2 s4 this will be parasagittal images and these are the most crucial images that you should be documenting to document or show the physician where if there is a chordothalamic hemorrhage this is the chordate nucleus and this is the thalamus this is the chordothalamic glue that should be normal and this is the choroid plexus lateral ventricle and this is the most important image in, in when you are dealing with intracranial hemorrhage when you are dealing with the neonate premature neonate most important sections are s2 and s4 they are called parasagittal images 
then coming s1 or s5 that is going through the insula or the sylvian fissures so you will not see the ventricles you will be see the sylvian fissure and the extreme parasagittal images this is s1 and s5 so the coronal views we can use the posterior fossa as an acoustic window whenever necessary usually with a good idea for an eye you will be able to image the whole brain uh, with the available images but sometimes if cause posterior frontal is slightly bigger or open still you can use that especially for imaging the posterior fossa so now we will come to the point so we, today we will be talking about prenatal uh, sorry pre uh, preterm babies cranial ultrasound screening for intraventricular hemorrhage intraventricular hemorrhage is germinal matrix hemorrhage so we should know what is germinal matrix this is a friable tissue of blood vessels it's a high, very hypervascular it's a endothelial lining that normally present and this is the stem source for neuroblast that disappears as the fetus grows in utero initially they line the entire ventricle and they regress to the corothalamic groove by 24 weeks greatly reduced by for 34 weeks and involutes completely by 40 weeks by 40 weeks of age you will not see a germinal matrix that's why there is no germinal matrix hemorrhage in a uh, grown well grown baby of 40 weeks or 38 weeks or 36 weeks you will not see normally a germinal matrix hemorrhage because there is no germinal matrix hemorrhage by that time the german matrix um, germinal matrix matures by 34 weeks of gestation so that hemorrhage becomes very unlikely after this age that is the importance of screening the uh, uh, near premature babies by cranial ultrasound when they are premature they have remaining germinal matrix and they are prone for hemorrhage when there is a uh, stress on, on the brain germinal matrix is not usually visualized by ultrasound if you see any echogenic material in the corothalamic group this should be considered as a possible bleed cerebral blood flow increases in response to hypertension hypoxia hypercapnia or acidosis so thereby they place stress on this vascular uh, structure and causes hemorrhage the bulk of the choroid plexus is in the trigome or artery of the lateral ventricle so this is very important remember choroid plexus is present only in the trigome and artery also choroid plexus can be found in the roof of third and fourth ventricle but not in the floor and also temporal horns of the lateral ventricle in the roof there can be some amount of choroid plexus there should not be any echogenic material in the frontal or occipital horns or dependent portion of temporal horn third ventricle or fourth ventricle this is a clue point that you should remember if you see any echogenic material in the floor of third ventricle floor of fourth ventricle frontal horn occipital horn or floor of temporal horns you should be suspecting hemorrhage any echogenic material in the wrong place i already mentioned these are the wrong places if you see any echogenic material this is what is called hemorrhage the most important point or location where you should look when you are screening for a germinal matrix is a corothalamic groove this is choroid nucleus thalamus corothalamic groove is the place where you will be looking uh, for the uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage and which is this image this is a s3 or s5 parasagittal images this is a crucial image so germinal matrix can affect a newborn of all gestation ages but most common in premature most germinal matrix hemorrhage occur in the first week of life and often is clinically silent that is the most important that's why we are doing screening if it is an adult they will present with a clinical sign or symptom baby cannot speak to you the neonatologist may not be able to identify the neurological sign there where that is where we the radiologist should do a screening ultrasound for this uh, neonates germinal matrix hemorrhage is reliably diagnosed with ultrasound yes 
ultrasound is the investigation to diagnose germinal matrix hemorrhage. Parenchymal injuries, ischemia, petechial hemorrhages, hemorrhagic in fact can be diagnosed with ultrasound but with less sensitivity. Rotary screening for germinal matrix hemorrhage is performed in infants of less than 32 weeks or less than 1500 grams. So these are the crucial points that you should remember. Based on this, we select when we should do a screening ultrasound. All this is based on the timing of intraventricular hemorrhage. All the babies, less than 32 weeks, out of them, 15% will have a yeah, uh, 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 germinal matrix hemorrhage. Less than 32 weeks, 2.9% of them will have grade 3 or 4 hemorrhage. If they are more premature and they are less than 28 weeks, then 15.5% uh, of them will have grade 3 or 4 hemorrhage. The more premature the baby, the more chance of having a hemorrhage and more chance of having a higher grade of hemorrhage. These are the two points that we should keep in mind. Then we let us look when the hemorrhage occurs. 50% of the hemorrhage occurs within 24 hours. Another 25% occurs in the next day within 48 hours. Another 15% occurs in another 24 hours. So 90% of the hemorrhage occurs within three days or 72 hours. So this is a point we should remember. This will decide in a screening protocol when you should do the first scan. So this all will be based on this thing. If you do the first scan in 24 hours, you are missing the rest of the 40%. If you are doing a scan in the four, uh, second day, you are missing the, another 15%. So ideally, there are protocols when you should do the scan for the screening for the first time. There are different uh, protocols designed by American uh, team, uh, 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 British team, and every country has their own protocols. But American protocol says you should do the screening ultrasound for all babies less than 32 weeks. And screening should be performed at 7 to 14 days and repeated at 36 to 40 weeks. British team says if the baby is less than 30 weeks, they should do one scan at day 1, day 3 and day 7 and day 28 for the evaluation of perimetricular lucency. And babies, if it is 32, 32 weeks, Day 1, day 7, and day 28 for the PBL. In our hospital, what we follow is basically based on American Academy uh, uh, protocol. We do uh, a day 3 when child is asymptomatic anytime if a patient is symptomatic. And follow up based on the first care. And day 28, and time character scan to evaluate for periventrical lucency. So I don't think every hospital is following any defined protocol. It based on their experiences. The basic understanding that we should have is 90% of the bleeding occurs within three days. So you can have a primary scan after three days. But if you are delaying, if the baby is asymptomatic, there is no harm in delaying until seven days so that you may get uh, until up to 100% of the bleeding in that primary scan. So it depends upon the scan set by the head of uh, neurology, uh, sorry, uh, neonatology at that hospital in uh, discussion with the team. So the primary understanding that we should have is the every day when you are progressing, there is an increase a chance of finding a hemorrhage it is increasing up to seven days. But the follow-up scan should be done day 28 or at the time of discharge, it should be time correct. That is for identifying perimetricular leukomalacia. Follow-up scan is based on the primary scan. 
but remember scan can be done on the first day or any time if the child is symptomatic what i am talking is only about screening ultrasound for intraventricular hemorrhage at the time of the birth if the baby has a convulsion you should do an ultrasound immediately you should not wait for a screening ultrasound so now we will come to the grading of germinal matrix hemorrhage the papilla classification that all of us know there is no much controversy on this grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 grade 1 is a simple hemorrhage in the uh, germinal matrix and it is not extending to the uh, ventricle grade 2 it extends to the ventricle but occupies less than 50 percent of the volume of the ventricle grade 3 uh, the, it extends to the ventricle and ventricle is dilated and it occupies more than 50% of the lateral ventricle under hole. Grade 4 is a parenchyma hemorrhage with or without grade 1, 2, 3. Th that is the classification. Previously, we all had a wrong concept. At least I had a wrong concept in my post days that grade 4 hemorrhage is an extension of uh, this germinal matrix hemorrhage into the parenchyma. But this is proven to be not uh, the same situation. The situation is something like this. Grade 4 hemorrhage can occur without a intraventricular hemorrhage or germinal matrix hemorrhage. Grade 4 means the baby has a venous infarction in the parenchyma. The venous infarction could be due to compression on the exiting the veins due to a mass effect due to any cause most commonly with the intraventricular hemorrhage causing obstruction of the outflowing veins causing uh, the venous infarction so coming into grade one you have a small germinal matrix hemorrhage that is grade one without ventricular dilatation grade two there is an extension to the lateral ventricle but lateral ventricle is not dilated and this is not occupying more than 50 percent Grade 3, the intraventricular hemorrhage extends, sorry, the uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage extends to the ventricle and it is occupying more than 50% of the ventricle and uh, the ventricle is dilated. That is grade 3. Grade 4, it is unrelated. There is an area of uh, hemorrhagic infarction in the brain. This baby already had a grade uh, 2 hemorrhage. The third day scan, it extended and caused the uh, hemorrhage in the parenchyma. But remember, hemorrhagic infarction in the brain can occur without any intraventricular hemorrhage or uh, primary germinal matrix hemorrhage. The sequelae of uh, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, the more, one of the chief concerns with the grade uh, for bleed is the loss of brain tissue resulting from degeneration of the necro, uh, necrotic area. These venous infarctions resolve with cyst formation, resulting into a porencephalic cyst. This is the most worst situation. This intraventricular hemorrhage can cause necrosis uh, and uh, uh, porencephalic cyst formation of the brain. Regardless of the cause, the neonate with the grade 4 bleed is at very high risk for adverse neurological outcome. Cerebellar hemorrhages. I think uh, Dr. Rajesh already mentioned about cerebellar images. We are uh, also seeing a lot of cerebellar images, especially for the pregnant ladies when you are giving high dose of aspirin uh, in IUGR cases. And this aspirin doses, I think it's affecting the babies as well. And they are prone for uh, more hemorrhages. Not only cerebellar, without germinal matrix hemorrhage, we are seeing babies with parenchymal hemorrhages in patients who are treated with aspirin in their pregnancy. The prognosis of uh, intracranial hemorrhage, the grade 1 and grade 2, uh, these are clinical aspects such, actually Dr. Rajesh has already mentioned but just I will go through what I have prepared. The grade 1 and grade 2 generally have a good prognosis. Outcome in grade 3 hemorrhage is usually good when no parenchymal injury was occurred generally bad prognosis for grade 4 as expected and uh, what can happen when there is a intraventricular hemorrhage they can have post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus 
periventricular leukomalacia, seizures, cerebral palsy, mineral retardation. These are the usual sickly that we uh, see and follow up. Coming to periventricular leukomalacia, this is also called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy of the retail. This is an alternate name for periventricular leukomalacia. It affects the periventricular zones, resulting in cavitation and periventricular cyst formation. Why this occurs? This is a watershed zone. We, uh, in adults, we describe water, water, watershed in fact. So where there is two territories meet, they are the watershed zones that will be affected when there is a stress. So in premature, this white matter zone is the watershed zone between the deep and superficial vessels. So they are the areas which are affected when these babies are put on stress due to any cause. So periventricular leukomalacia occurs most commonly in premature infant. And out of, uh, if they are uh, less than 33 weeks, uh, uh, almost 38% of uh, babies will have uh, periventricular leukomalacia. If they are less than 1,500 grams, these are from the two studies, after, uh, almost 45% of them will have uh, leukomalacia. Detection of periventricular leukomalacia is important because a clinical a significant percentage of surviving premature infants develop cerebral palsy, intellectual impairment, and visual disturbances. So how you diagnose periventricular leukomalacia by ultrasound? Early periventricular leukomalacia presents as an area of increased periventricular echogenicity. And this echogenicity should be more than that of choroid plexus. The most significant sequelae of periventricular leukomalacia is cystic change of the affected brain matter, which can develop as late as four weeks after birth. This is very important. Ultrasound findings may be normal in the primary scan, when, but they develop clinical and delayed imaging, which will show periventricular leukomalacia. Ultrasound is highly reliable in detection of cystic white matter injury, that cystic periventricular leukomalacia, grade two or more, but they are have limitations in identifying non-cystic by periventricular leukomalacia. I think Dr. Rajesh has already mentioned, see, my, uh, part of my talk was already uh, taken care of by Dr. Rajesh, so I am not uh, dealing with that. So non-cystic white matter injury is considerably more common than cystic white matter injury. So 2% of the neo preterm neonate born before 32 weeks develop cystic periventricular leukomalacia. How to grade periventricular leukomalacia? Grade 1. They will have just increased periventricular echogenicity persisting more than 7 days. This is a very difficult situation. And any scan you do, you will think there is a periventricular echogenicity and should not be confused for this thing. And you should do a follow-up scan after 7 days. If it is persisting, you can call us periventricular leukomalacia. Otherwise, it is a flare Grade 2, development of small periventricular cyst. Grade 3, development of extensive periventricular cyst in the occipital and front occipital lobes. Grade 4, development of extensive subcortical cyst. This is a grade 1 periventricular leukomalacia. <coughs> but this is a very uh, controversial area that many uh, the beginners are likely to uh, keep a diagnosis of periventricular leukomalacia for most of the patients. If there are areas of increased periventricular echogenicity without any cyst formation persisting for more than seven days, that is called grade one. As I said, it is non-specific finding that must be differentiated from the normal periventricular halo or normal hyperechoic blush posterior superior to the ventricular trigons. These are the normal things that should not be confused. And suspect periventricular leukomalacia, if the echogenicity is asymmetric, see, they, they will not be symmetric in both sides. And they are coarse, they are not homogeneous. They are globular or more hyperechoic than coral plexus. So just if you see a hyperechogenicity, which is less echogenic than the coral plexus, don't label them as a uh, uh, grade 1 uh, periventricular leukomalacia unless they are inhomogeneous, asymmetric, coarse, or globular. Grade 2, development of small periventricular cyst 
in the front operator lobes. The echogenicity may be resolved at the time of cyst formation. So the initial echogenicity, what we have seen, might have resolved when you see cyst. Cystic periventricular leukomalacia identified on the first day of life indicate that the adverse event was at least two weeks prenatal rather than post perinatal or postnatal. I hope you understand this point. If you see periventricular cyst in the first day of scan, it means the baby had an insult at least two weeks before. So this is not a, uh, a, a problem of the per, uh, per, perinatal or postnatal. It was a prenatal issue. So this is a grade three extensive periventricular cyst in the occipital and front of or, uh, perinatal region. And grade four periventricular echogenicity in the deep uh, white matter developing into extensive subcortical cyst. Periventricular grade four is seen mostly in full term neonates. And one, two, three is a disease of the preatium neonates. This is another point that we should remember. Grade four periventricular leukomalacia may be seen in full term neonates. But grade one, two, three is a disease of the preterm neonates. Flaring, as I mentioned, if you see a periventricular echogenicity that disappears in seven days, that is called flaring. It has no uh, clinical significance. Periventricular leukomalacia, there are a lot of differential diagnoses. You may see the similar appearance in other ischemia periventricular hemorrhagic infections, infectious insults, malformations, genetic and metabolic causes that we are not discussing now. Periventricular leukomalacia, the limitations of ultrasound. Ultrasound has limited sensitivity and specificity in detecting periventricular leukomalacia, especially if the lesions are very small and grade one. Grade two, three, four, there are no problems. Ultrasound is highly sensitive. But in grade one, ultrasound has limitations and the MRI may be able to help. <coughs> Serial ultrasound examination and the use of brain MRI can improve this uh, detection of uh, grade one PVL. MRI is the imaging modality of choice for diffuse non cystic periventricular leukomalacia. With the increasing survival rate of extremely preterm infants, the non-cystic form of periventricular leukomalacia has become important in the current neonatal care of preterm infants. We know in our uh, 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 learning time, babies born out 30 weeks or 32 weeks or 34 weeks never used to survive. Now we are able to uh, give life to babies even for 24 weeks, 26 weeks. So this is the importance or advancements in the neonatal care so, which has increased the premature babies surviving, which has increased the a number of premature babies developing intracranial hemorrhage. And so the number of intracranial hemorrhage has increased because of the surviving babies uh, number has increased. Coming to the prognosis, I think uh, Dr. Rajesh has already discussed these points. So, a baby is born 28 to 32 weeks, the classical type of periventricular leukomalacia with cyst formation, it is related to the development of cerebral palsy. 28 to 32 weeks, they most usually goes for cerebral palsy. Less than 28 weeks, diffuse cerebral white matter injury. Their neurologic outcome is predominated by cognitive environment and they are less likely to manifest the typical spastic diplegia cerebral palsy syndrome at the school age. Less than 1,500 gram. These all are uh, uh, studies which are shown these findings and uh, Dr. Rajesh may be able to describe more as I am not a clinician. Uh, they are particularly prone to brain injury that involves periventricular leukomalacia associated with neurological uh, axonal disease termed as encephalopathy of the prematurity. Common sickly includes cognitive, behavioral, attentional, and socialization deficits, while cerebral palsy, major motor deficits, and less frequent outcome in the uh, uh, more premature babies. So when we are discussing about periventricular leukomalacia, you should be familiar with the very common cystic lesions that you see in the brain when you are screening in the brain. So they can be classified as a gliosis or the either the baby has gliosis or hemorrhage. If there is a gliosis hemorrhage, 
they can be seen whether it is above the lateral ventricle, periventricular leukomeratia. If it is below lateral ventricle, they are maybe uh, subependymous cyst. And there is no gliosis or hemorrhage. They can be conatal cyst. This is a graphical representation I have made. This is a uh, periventricular leukomeratia. They will be above the ventricle. This is a conatal cyst that is also called a coarctation of the lateral ventricle. This is a subependymous cyst. This is a porangophilic cyst. That is very clear. But these all uh, cystic uh, lesions should be differentiated from periventricular leukomeratia. Coming to conatal cyst, uh, very, this is very commonly seen. And this is a congenital anomaly that is also called a coarctation of the lateral ventricle. And they are seen in a 7% in low birth weight babies. This have no significance. And uh, they result from the approximation of the walls of the frontal horns. And they form coarctation. And they will appear as a cyst. Actually, this is a continuation of the frontal horn so by a septa. So this is a conatal cyst. That should not be confused for periventricular leukomalacia. Subappendement cyst. There can be two types, either acquired or congenital. Acquired ones are essentially of the small hemorrhage. They form a cyst formation. And congenital ones are germinolytic cyst. They, they are just inferior to the uh, frontal horns and posterior to the foramen of mantra. But conatal cyst is anterior to the foramen of mantra. These are the two differentiating points for the radiology. And uh, the, uh, here comes uh, the uh, periventricular leukomalacia. They will be superior to the frontal horns and in the parenchyma. So this is the correct location of the periventricular leukomalacia cyst. Porangophilic cysts are uh, secondly of uh, damage to the brain, necrosis, and formation of cysts. So they, they are the most commonly formed after a hemorrhagic infection. Or, uh, you will see a necrosis, then you will see they are communicating with the lateral ventricle, they are porangephalic cyst. They, that's a uh, appearance that you will see. They all should not be, that's very easy. It should not be confused for a uh, uh, periventricular leukomalacia. In conclusion, all preterm babies should be screened for germinal matrix hemorrhage and uh, periventricular leukomalacia. Ultrasound is the most widely used neuroimaging tool in premature infants because we can repeat any time, any hour, any day, whenever you want, and it's very easy to handle. And appropriate protocol of imaging and timing should be followed. This will be based on uh, the uh, departmental decision. And uh, uh, the only thing that we should remember is the slight delay in the primary scan will improve the detection of the hemorrhages without unnecessary follow-ups. Special care should be taken for the baby in the incubator. That's very important. We are dealing with the premature babies and we should take care of uh, their safety. And MRI imaging modality of choice for diffuse non-cystic periventricular leukomalacia. Thank you. And that's here at the end of my talk. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Roy. That was an excellent uh, uh, presentation. It was very systematic, going from basics, technique, um, what to look for, and uh, how to do, how to go about it. Uh, only uh, only issue I had was uh, you referred to Dr. Manoj as Dr. Rajesh many times. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, before the, the key questions, uh, uh, one one uh, issue I thought was that uh, Dr. Manoj had mentioned about uh, another uh, uh, classification system uh, of the hemorrhage. Uh, so, uh, so are there now two systems classification? Uh, can I answer? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Manoj, please. Yeah, so actually, Professor Volpe's classification is actually the basics are still the papyls classification only. What is actually uh, being the dynamicity is given to that classification. If you say grade 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, the basically the original papyl classification is based on just CT scan. You don't do CT scan on a neonate anymore. So the classification is invalid. Whatever here described are based on the CT scan findings. So now we can, it has been modified subsequently. So the Volpe's classification is purely ultrasound based. So probably that is a more and it has a dynamicity to it. That is why where so uh, probably the uh, the grade four which was 
there in the papyls can be thought of as gray uh, the uh, pe, uh, the um, periventricular hemorrhagic infarction but then as rightly said by dr uh, roy george uh, like uh, this can occur even without a intraventricular hemorrhage so these suspects are may better explained in uh, professor volpi's classification so i think it's time to it is not very new it is also quite old but much after uh, 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 10 15 years after the uh, papyls class it's time to go on to the volpi's classification because that is what actually we are not using ct scan to uh, classify anymore is that okay explanation yeah, yeah. dr roy would you like to add actually i am not familiar with this classification i not heard Um, first time I'm hearing from uh, Dr. Manoj, and we are not following the SCAR classification. So uh, I will read more on that, and I will see how uh, he can be actually, this is the, hospital. Yeah. Actually, that is the point. While uh, uh, we uh, we should have a uh, uh, across the concern, uh, we are uh, basically we should understand that we are uh, doing it for the uh, clinician, and uh, but they should also understand. We basically we are doing it for the baby. so what should be best for the baby that should be done so if there is some uh, disparity in what we are conveying and what the clinician uh, so we should be i think we should uh, if there is a change required we should go for that that is exactly the point actually most of the time there is a disconnect between uh, the uh, person who actually does and the person who asks actually asks for that is actually not going to serve the purpose because so that probably you know like uh, as you said this dialogue is very very important yeah it's important. thank you dr manoj and dr roy for the inputs uh, are there any questions uh, one question is uh, maybe it's uh, dr roy uh, any experience with the elastography to prognosticate a neurodevelopmental outcome as elastography or the neuro uh, actually i have uh, no experience oh, okay can i just uh, make a few points regarding elastography yeah see elastography is one of the, um, the recent techniques to increase the diagnostic capability of uh, the classical ultrasound the problem in ultrasound is we always say it's subjective this has added an objectivity to it actually what is what is happening is the tissue the, uh, originally elastography came as a ultrasound tool in liver but then now it has been extended to other uh, other areas like the brain also and now recently from france originally and from other country there are various papers which are looked at the neonatal uh, and, and the cranial ultrasound elastography looking at uh, how it adds to the um, sensitivity and specificity for various neuropathology actually what is actually elastography it is actually detecting the tissue stiffness between various areas so the the, the uh, ultra so if you have if you can quantify this ultrasound the problem everybody says subjective so it is not subjective anymore if you if you can really put in this elastography concept it is no longer a subjective thing you are actually going to measure the values of stiffness so it has the potential i am not saying that is the standard of care it is not but it has the potential to add some objective and quantitative data to the ultrasound imaging and actually you know um, the in neo neonatal brain why this is important is it is like liver it's always liver in an adult also is uh, it's never the same it will keep growing and all the, the thing here also the myelination neuropil formation and all no so what is actually happening is the brain is evolving in the neonate so the stiffness of the same area uh, good that i i really like the way dr roy george said c1 to c6 if you are going to put it that way and i wish we had the luxury of our technicians doing the ultrasound and then giving us to interpret it so if you are going to objectively do that so here what is actually happening is the brain stiffness in the same same point of view you are going to look at the stiffness and then you are going to interpret whether that is going to predict the um, and the, uh, the lesion how is it progress so potentially it has got a lot of application lesions like pvl and all that elastography can really change the way we define pvl and uh, so that is there but uh, the studies are all still studies it is not the standard of care in neonatal ultrasound probably in 
liver adult liver i know that it is the standard of care uh, the, the ultrasound elastography can be done for various things uh, but then uh, not in unilateral ultrasound people have started doing it in the last 5 years people have started doing it papers have started coming in people are saying that this may help us to better prognosticate neuropathology so that is all uh, i think uh, that's the importance i don't think we should Uh, discuss elastography in the context of cranial ultrasound of course it's a recent advance i don't want to add these because as it is we are we were looking at the practical aspects isn't it uh, thank you dr manoj actually you know the question dr rajesh asked me about my experience in elastography in brain that's what i said i don't have any experience actually we are doing elastography for uh, thyroid breast and liver yeah we are and we are doing but i don't have any experience uh, in using for brain i thought uh, you have some experience are no, you, i uh, don't think anybody in the country here in india are uh, doing the, all these papers are come from the west okay. the uh, cranial ultrasound elastography papers original one was from france and then subsequently we have from various countries us canada and all the various papers i don't think anybody to my knowledge correct me if i'm wrong uh, Uh, cranial ultrasound elastography is uh, not uh, being done in UNH. Probably under research setting, somebody do, doing. I'm not aware. Please correct me. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Roy. Uh, I know you are uh, you are confined your your topic to uh, neonatal screening. Uh, uh, would you like to add any word on uh, Doppler? Dr. Manoj had mentioned uh, MC Doppler. Uh, uh, See, the Doppler can be used based on the resistive indexes and uh, vascularity, but this is not done in a screening ultrasound. This is all called diagnostic ultrasound, and you know, even for a congenital anomaly, we do a diagnostic ultrasound. So my talk was based uh, only for the screening ultrasound for uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage, and there is a role for uh, even even uh, UGR babies. We uh, do a um, yeah, um, exactly. cranial ultrasound. And we see the resistive index and how, uh, how much resistance the brain has. Similar effect we can uh, uh, derive from the postnatal uh, um, brain ultrasound of the neonate. And uh, we, we we have some cases which where we have done even we were able to detect some uh, vascular anomalies also when we are doing Doppler. But this is not the part of a screening ultrasound of uh, cranial hemorrhage. Yeah, I know. Thank you. uh one question was uh, how to differentiate it from infection i don't know what that uh, specific infection uh, maybe the leukomalacia see uh, di- differentiating a uh, different infection or anything it's a dif- uh, subject a different of topic. Uh, yeah. discussion it will have a different uh, clinical aspect that's not a part of uh, screening ultrasound see anything in the periventricular areas uh, echogenicity is there will be a lot of differential diagnosis i have listed a uh, number of uh, diseases which can be mimicked by periventricular leukomalacia this all will go with the clinical settings and the, uh, in discussion with the neonatologist we may be able to they will present with the same patient with meningitis will have a different type of uh, clinical presentation and that's not what we are expecting uh, with the intraventricular hemorrhage Uh, i think uh, we have uh, finished questions uh, dr manoj uh, uh, do you have anything uh, to add i just saw so just now i opened a quandary box and, uh, somebody has written elastography may help to diagnose uh-huh. grade 1 pvl some studies report that's what i said in non cystic pvl now there is a scope for um, with the cranial but these are all study do not go by study reports the basic thing is evidence way evidence has to evolve you cannot say say that as you can do elastography brain elastography and they probably no the thing is that there are reports promising reports let it evolve till then let it be under the research setting only it's not a standard of care and i really want to thank rajesh and the uh, radiology forum for having this interactive session because this is the way it should go uh most of the time uh, the, uh, the the uh, the uh, the uh, communication uh, uh, gap you now can be uh, really sorted out by such meetings actually congratulations you have started in a very nice venture it needs to be <laughs> encouraged yeah, beyond me. and thank you so much thank you dr manoj and uh, dr shafi dr shafi 
unmute yourself okay yeah <laughs> it's a well balanced uh, talk between roy and manav sir uh, so manav sir was uh, elaborating on what clinician needs from our reports and uh, i would add that uh, we should approach a case like an algorithmic approach whether the what whether it is present then how we, how you proceed to the next level like uh, how we should proceed I mean after some days we should repeat uh, that that is well elaborated from both of you and uh, i i don't think many will have uh, more questions on uh, regarding this topic because uh, all are well covered thank you so much sir thank you thank you so much thank you very much dr roy and uh, dr manoj good night and uh, dr sipi thank you good night, good night. Uh, yeah we we'll call it a day Thank you. Good Thank night, you. everybody. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj.